The film industry can be ruthless. One minute you're on top of the world, and the next minute you're irrelevant. Things are even worse for people in the industry that fall outside the sparkling family-friendly norms set by the big execs. And that's exactly the tragedy that happened to Tommy Lee Kirk, who passed away this year. The famous Disney Channel star from classics like Old Yeller, The Absent-Minded Professor, and The Shaggy Dog. Kirk reached heights many actors could only dream of, but when he chose to be true to himself, the higher-ups turned on him. Today, we'll learn the tragic and inspiring story of Tommy Kirk. Thomas Lee Kirk was born December 10th of 1941 in Louisville, Kentucky. Kirk's mother Lucy worked as a legal secretary while his father, Louis, worked for the state's highway department as a mechanic. While Kentucky is far away from the Hollywood Hills and the big screen, Tommy wouldn't stay there very long. Only a little over a year after he was born, the Kirks packed up their things and moved out to Los Angeles County in Downey, California so that Tommy's dad could work as a mechanic in an airplane factory, which ramped up production during World War II. Kirk's brother, Joe, was the one who indirectly got Tommy into acting. Tommy's brother, Joe, went to the Pasadena Playhouse audition for the part in Ah Wilderness by Eugene O'Neill. Tommy tagged along and his brother didn't get the part, but at 12 years old, Tommy decided to audition too since he was already there. Joe Kirk didn't get the role, and he lost it to Bobby Driscoll, who went on to act in multiple movies and voiced in Peter Pan. But Tommy actually got a role. He said it was because no one else showed up, but backstage at the actual venue, an agent gave Tommy his card and asked his folks to give him a call, so he was clearly doing something right. Lewis and Lucy Kirk called him up, and Tommy officially signed to the Gertz Talent Agency in Beverly Hills. Tommy's first role with Gertz was in The Last of the Old Time Shooting Sheriffs on TV Reader's Digest, directed by William Baudin, who directed over 400 films. Tommy's talent was blowing people away, and he started getting cast in TV roles right away. The magazine described Tommy's rise to fame, saying, Kirk was in heavy demand as an actor almost immediately. Watching his early performances, it's easy to see why. He was in wide-eyed, gangly, keen, and immensely likable. The very picture of Eisenhower-era American youth, unaffected and natural, surprisingly not annoying, extremely easy to cast as someone's kid, brother, son, or neighbor. At this stage of his career, Tommy Kirk acted mostly in old-school hour-long dramas like Gunsmoke, Letter to Loretta, Crossroads, Lux Video Theater, and Down Liberty Road, where he worked with Golden Globe, and multiple Emmy winner Angeline Dickinson, although this project was basically an ad for Greyhound buses. But out of all these matinee theater was Tommy's favorite TV project. He worked on 37 projects with matinee theater of the span of 5 years and he looked at it like trading. Tommy got to meet with famous and formative figures in the business and he started to get famous. Tommy's brother Joe went on to become a dentist, but in 1956 Tommy landed a role as a different Joe in the classic crime show The Hardy Boys along Tim Considine as Frank. The show first aired Disney's variety show called The Mickey Mouse Club. Disney liked Tommy so much that they signed him to a seven year contract the very next year and cast him in one of his most famous roles, Travis in the acclaimed classic Old Yeller. Old Yeller was so successful, it was even preserved by its addition to the National Film Registry in 2019, which is run by the Library of Congress. As Travis, Tommy showcased his acting abilities by crying on cue for the finale of the movie, and his authenticity shows when you compare this scene to other actors who only fake it with eye drops. Tommy even said in an interview, You can't fake it. You've gotta cry. You can't just make a face. On set, Tommy met actress Beverly Washburn, who played the neighbor girl, and the two became friends for life. Recalling their time together, Beverly said Kirk was a brilliant child actor. He was so gifted, and he was adorable. She also said that Tommy would always bring a box of chocolates when they would go out to dinner together. While the ending of the film was an emotional wreck for many unsuspecting people in theaters back in the day, 
according to Washburn. Tommy looked at the film with a glass half full outlook, she said. Tommy's philosophy on it was, it's about love and loss. Life throws us some curves sometimes. Not everything is a white picket fence. Of course, maybe Tommy gained this perspective after the roller coaster of his life had finally settled down, or maybe it was an omen of the hard times that Tommy would face just a few years after his timeless role. While working with Disney, Tommy got to host a new special for the 1956 presidential nomination conventions for both the Democratic and Republican parties. He did voice acting work for a US adaptation of a Russian film called The Snow Queen and unpronounceable Danish movies, such as Vester Havsdrenge. He guest starred in the series The O. Henry Playhouse. But over the next few years, Tommy Kirk enjoyed a high wave of success thanks to Disney. He was cast in the 1959's The Shaggy Dog, the absent-minded professor from 1961, son of Flubber from 1963, and that same year Tommy Kirk also acted in the sequel to Old Yeller, Savage Sam. But of all of the films he worked on, 1960's Swiss Family Robinson was his favorite. And it was a huge success grossing over 40 million, which would have been around 307 million today. Tommy had some good years working for Disney. Back then, the founder was still alive, and Tommy even had some face-to-face -face interactions with the legend. According to an interview with the Orlando Sentinel in 1991, Tommy's favorite memory of Disney was when the two had a chance meeting at a hotel in Beverly Hills. Kirk said Disney was with Hedda Hopper, the legendary columnist. He put his arm around me and he said, this is my good luck piece here, to Hedda Hopper. I never forgot that. Kirk went on to act in an episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour and he was in the family comedy Bon Voyage with Fred McMurray and Jane Wyman. And Tommy really looked up to Fred but McMurray was all business. Kirk said, I liked him very much, but the feeling wasn't mutual. That hurt me a lot, and for a long time I hated him. It's hard not to hate somebody who doesn't like you. I was sort of looking for a father figure, and I pushed him too hard. We had a couple of blow-ups on set. He was a nice person, but I was just too demanding. I came on too strong because I desperately wanted to be his friend. Tommy also had a hard time with Jane, saying... She was very mean to me. She went out of her way to be shitty. But she was a total bitch, and I think she was homophobic. And that was a problem because Tommy Kirk had known he was gay for years by that point. In an interview, he said, I considered my teenage years as being desperately unhappy. I knew I was gay, but I had no outlet for my feelings. It was very hard to meet people, and at that time, there was no place to go to socialize. It wasn't until the early 60s that I began to hear of places where gays congregated. The lifestyle was not recognized and I was very, very lonely. I had some brief, very passionate encounters and as a teenager I had some affairs, but they were only stolen, back alley kind of things. They were very desperate and miserable. When I was about 17 or 18 years old, I finally admitted to myself that I wasn't going to change. I didn't know what the consequences would be but I had the definite feeling that it was going to wreck my Disney career and maybe my whole acting career and it was all going to come to an end. Like a self-fulfilling prophecy, Tommy's life took a turn for the worse by the mid-1960s. Growing up with fame and money got to him. He began drinking and using drugs heavily. In an interview with Scarlet Streak, Kirk said, I was high all the time. It was a terrible period in my life. A few years before things got really bad, Tommy and a friend were almost killed in a car crash in Arizona. The car was totaled, but the two passengers were unharmed. At one point, in 1964, not even 10 years after his role in Old Yeller, Tommy was arrested on marijuana-related charges during a police raid at a Hollywood party. Afterward, the district attorney's office didn't press charges, but the city attorney's office were pursued Tommy because they found barbiturates in his car. While these can be abused, they're mostly anti-anxiety and anti-convulsant drugs, and Tommy actually had a prescription so the charges were thrown out. This led to him getting replaced on one of his active roles, and Tommy was furious. He said, This town is full of right-wingers. The world is full of right-wingers, intolerant, cruel sons of bitches. But he would change his tune, saying, He richly deserved to be fired from the studios because of his irresponsibility. 
A person on drugs is not fit for work. One last straw broke the camel's back. Kirk was in Burbank, California, where someone saw him getting it on on a public pool with another guy. After that, Disney decided Tommy Kirk was no longer the family-friendly star he once was, and they promptly cut ties with him by opting not to renew his contract. And the main man, Walter Elias Disney, would die just a few years later on December 15th of 1966, firmly closing the door on that era of Kirk's life. Disney didn't make the firing public, and Kirk would rebound for a bit to work with American International Pictures for The Maid and The Martian, but the quality was a steep drop off. After his contract crumbled with Disney, Kirk worked on a handful of movies for producers nowhere near the caliber of a Disney studio, with most ranging from middling to downright awful. Titles included the 1967 Blood of Ghastly Horror, and who could forget the 1966 release of The Ghost in the Invisible Bikini? Tommy said, After I was fired from Disney, I did some of the worst movies ever made, and I got involved with the manager, who said it didn't matter what you did as long as you kept working. He would put me in every piece of shit that anybody offered. I did a series of terrible things, but it was only to get the money. By this period of his life, Tommy was totally off the rails, and his drug abuse was taking hold of his career, he said. I was drinking, taking pills, smoking grass. In fact, I was pretty wild. I came into a whole lot of money, but I threw a lot of parties and spent it all. I wound up completely broke. I had no self-discipline, and I had almost died of a drug overdose a couple of times. It's a miracle that I'm still around. All of that didn't help the situation. Nobody would touch me. I was considered a box office poison. In 1967, Tommy Kirk acted in Track of Thunder, and he said, I was about half awake in that film. I just sort of walked through it and took the money. And then there was the 1969 classic, It's Alive, directed by Larry Buchanan. And Tommy dished out some barbecue level burns when he talked about that movie in an interview with a Kentucky-based newspaper called the Lexington Herald Leader saying, It's a monster movie it's so cheap that the monster wore a scuba suit and had ping ball balls for eyes. Whatever it was, if it was alive, it's not anymore, Tommy would also say. What I was doing in those pictures, I don't know. The only thing I could say is that I had a drug problem then, and I didn't know what I was doing or what I was getting into. I was an idiot. Larry's like a cinematic serial killer, and he's got to be stopped before he kills again. In the early 1970s, Kirk's fast and loose lifestyle led him to act in two movies that weren't sanctioned by the Screen Actors Guild, so he lost his membership and said, to hell with the whole thing, to hell with show business, I'm going to make a new life for myself, and I just got off drugs, completely kicked all that stuff. By the mid-1970s, Kirk had quit acting altogether, while this period created a sad void in time that might sadden fellow film fans in the audience. There was a silver lining to Kirk's departure. In 1973, Tommy came out publicly in an interview with Marvin Jones. He had a few features here and there, but he was mostly working as a busboy in a restaurant. He decided to turn his life around and quit drugs altogether and found his faith in Christianity. When talking about his time and his life, he said, Christianity helped purge himself or resentment and bitterness. The former A-list actor turned born-again Christian started a carpet and upholstery cleaning business that ran for 20 years, and for the next 10 years or so after he founded it, he kept to his modest living, but the call to act would echo in Tommy's soul once again, and this time the culture of Hollywood might have been more accepting of Tommy's identity. In the 1990s and early 2000s, a much older Tommy Kirk returned to act in a handful of films starting with 1995's Attack of the 60-Foot Centerfolds. Then he would come back three years later for a part as Mr. Kenner in Little Miss Magic and the movie Billy Frankenstein, both in 1998, and then finally The Education of a Vampire in 2001. From the time he found faith all through that 2001 appearance, Kirk would spend most of his time in the public eye by attending autograph booths at conventions and other venues, and he would attend them with his friend Beverly Washburn, who
who lived with him near LA. Washburn said that Tommy would always give free autographs for any fans that came in in uniform. Maybe that was his way of giving back after he caused so much trouble in the past. Washburn said, He always say, There are heroes, and I'll give them a free picture. After turning his life around, Tommy was awarded Disney Legend status by the company in 2006. He said, I don't blame anyone but myself and my drug abuse for my career, going haywire. I'm not ashamed of being gay, never have been, and never will be. For that I make no apologies. I have no animosity toward anyone because the truth is, I wrecked my own career. That same year, he retired with a pension fund in Redding, California. Just a couple months ago, on September 28th of 2021, Tommy Kirk died in Las Vegas, Nevada at the age of 79. And that's the story of Disney's biggest stars who was cast out for being gay, crashed his own career, and eventually found redemption outside of the spotlight.